Ding dong, the witch is red. Which old witch? Well, the Scarlet Witch, obviously. Sam Raimi returns to the realm of Marvel movies with Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness, and it might give Steven top billing, but this is just as much a movie about Wanda, who definitely spreads her particular brand of crazy across multiple universes. Plus, America Chavez makes her MCU debut in a literally starring role, but as you might expect, multiple magic users toying with reality itself has massive implications for the future of the multiverse. So we're here to unpack all of that, but before we do, we're about to spoil this whole movie, so if you haven't seen it yet or would rather just draw your own conclusions, here's your cue to warp into a universe where you're not watching this video. I need your help. With what? What do you know about the multiverse? All right, we're past the spoiler warning, so let's get right to the good stuff. Doctor Strange's longtime love interest from the comics has dramatically entered the MCU, and Steven only has eyes for her. Th three of them, to be exact. Okay, let's back things up a little bit, because that sounds weird. When the credits roll, it looks like Steven's gotten everything sorted out and can finally enjoy some downtime when suddenly he doubles over in agony in the middle of a busy New York City crosswalk and sprouts a third eye in the middle of his forehead, which A, looks pretty painful, and B, kind of permanent. Fast forward to the mid-credits scene, and Steven, seemingly recovered from his eye-popping headache, is walking in New York when Charlize Theron literally emerges from a hole in the universe, rocking some kooky purple armor and some big shoulder pads. She tells Strange that he has caused some problems and she needs his help setting things right, unless he's too scared. He's definitely not too scared, so he naturally transforms his jaunty red scarf into the Cloak of Levitation, pops open his newly formed third eye, and follows her off into what looks like the Dark Dimension where he bargained with Dormammu, but who is Clea and what does she want? Well, if her signature look didn't give it away, the credits sure did. This is Clea, aka the future Mrs. Doctor Strange from the comics, so good timing on getting over that Christine baggage there, Steve. What's the saying when one door closes and other opens? I guess in this case, it's not so much a door as it is an interdimensional rift, but you get the idea. As you might have guessed, Clea is a sorcerer as well, and not just any, but the Sorcerer Supreme of the Dark Dimension. She's half faulting on her mother's side, an extra-dimensional being of pure magic, and get this, Dormammu, the villain from the first movie, is technically her uncle. In the comics, when Doctor Strange traveled to the Dark Dimension in pursuit of Dormammu, Clea tagged along to help, and wouldn't you know it, they fell in love. Comics Clea sometimes stays on Earth, growing her magical prowess and aiding Strange, and other times she returns to the Dark Dimension to seize ruling control from Dormammu in rebellion. She's a powerful magic wielder and on par with Doctor Strange, in fact. MCU fans should definitely expect to see more of her moving forward, but for now, let's recap what actually went down in this movie during the, you know, little two-hour chunk that led up to the credits. The film opens by throwing us right into the action. A variant ponytail Doctor Strange, who we like to call Defender Strange, is protecting America Chavez from a giant bandage monster as they both head for the Book of Vishanti, which could save them all. Marvel readers might recognize America Chavez as superhero Miss America from the comics. She has unique powers that make her pretty crucial to this story, which is set in the midst of multiversal chaos. MCU mastermind Kevin Feige breaks it down for us so we don't have to. If there are other people who are tracking the story of the MCU, a lot of this, not only is from WandaVision, but from Loki. Because at the end of Loki, something happens that allows our universe to be exposed to the broader multiverse. And we saw what that can mean already in Spider-Man No Way Home. And that's what allowed the other Spideys to come here and, and, and Doctor Strange's spell to go wrong. And it's what really sets off this movie with, in particular, the character America Chavez. And that's sort of what kicks off the Multiverse of Madness. Anyway, as Defender Strange and America Chavez get cornered, Defender Strange says the only way to stop this big monster from stealing America's powers, which she can't actually control herself, is for Strange to kill her and then absorb her powers, which he presumably would be able to control. In the struggle, America opens a star-shaped portal as the Beast kills Defender Strange and is then primed to kill America Chavez too. But in his dying moments, Defender Strange frees America from the monster's grasp and all three go tumbling through the portal. And that's when we see our Doctor Strange wake up in the MCU, kind of freaked out. She's got the power to jump between different universes, but she can't control it, and she's being pursued because that's a dope-ass power, and most people would probably want that, especially if you're evil. Most recently, she's being chased by this monster, which had all these runic markings all over its body and tentacles. Runes are more of a witch's areas of expertise than a sorcerer's, so Strange gets the idea to go talk to Wanda about it, thinking that she might understand the markings and what they imply. He catches up with her where she's been lying low at her remote apple orchard from the end of WandaVision. So they turn to Wanda for help, now that she's ended her little social experiment in Westview, New Jersey, healed from the loss of Vision, and she clearly learned all of the right lessons that she was supposed to learn after WandaVision, except she actually didn't! She was the one who's been after America Chavez in the first place. 
She constructed the apple orchard with the magic and the influence of the Darkhold, which she's basically not been able to put down since that closing shot in WandaVision. It's a real page turner, apparently. Wanda wants America Chavez's power so she can leave the main MCU timeline and join her sons Tommy and Billy in another universe where they still exist or where they actually existed in the first place. It's clear that Wanda is still grieving and heartbroken after the events of WandaVision, and frankly, can you blame her? She wants to find her boys and resume their idyllic life together, and she would do terrible things to make that happen. And spoiler alert, she does. She kills a whole bunch of people. We'll get back to Wanda in a second, but Strange's main goal here is to save America Chavez and stop Wanda from spreading chaos across the multiverse. The last thing we want is that whole Westview experiment, but for literally everything. Real quick, let's talk about the different versions of Doctor Strange. All told, there are four of them in this movie, maybe four and a half. There's our basic default Prime Earth 616 Strange. There's Defender Strange, who has a ponytail, and then who dies in the beginning and then becomes a Dreamwalker zombie later in the movie, so that's either one or two Stranges, depending how you're counting. There's Sinister Strange, who gets defeated by 616 and an expertly placed fence post. And then there's 838 Strange, who defeated Thanos in his universe, but at a cost great enough that Black Bolt needed a word with him. Anyone else, that might need a stern talking to, but Black Bolt's voice is an absurdly powerful force, so that Strange gets atomized. Now make no mistake here, Wanda is the villain of this movie, but the Illuminati sure doesn't think so. The Illuminati, of course, is another Marvel supergroup, and in the case of this movie, they're all variants from Universe 838. They've all gathered because they think that Doctor Strange is the real threat, and he's not, at least not to them. Wanda kills all of them rather spectacularly, and we'll give you the gory details of all that in a second, so hang tight, I swear, it's juicy. But anyway, in the end, Wanda realizes that she was wrong and even appears to die before destroying her stronghold on Mount Wondegore, seemingly ending this multiverse of madness. America learns to control her powers and winds up in Kamartage doing sorcerer training and Strange pops that third eye. And all in all, it seemed like this movie was gonna rip the MCU to shreds to set up the next phase, but it ends with everything everywhere kind of all in one piece. Well, with a few exceptions. Okay, so let's talk about Wanda some more. Doctor Strange tries a very interesting gambit to stop her, to just give her what she wants. America allows Wanda to come in contact with another universe's version of her long-lost kiddos, Tommy and Billy, where Wanda enacts her plan to replace their in-universe mother with herself, which is kind of a creepy Rick Sanchez type of thing to do when you think about it. Suit yourself. <clears throat> But of course, the boys soundly reject our Wanda and run into their Wanda's arms, which breaks our Wanda's heart, and her plan was exactly as faulty as America said it would be, and she resigns herself to destroying the Darkhold and her fortress and herself instead. So she heads back to her throne on Mount Wondegore and destroys the Darkhold across every possible universe. Dr. Palmer says she did the right thing, and with that, we see the structure where Wanda is, with the Darkhold's ruins all over it, and it collapses on itself, and it seemingly crushes Wanda along with it. So is she dead? Strange seems to confirm as much, but then again, we did also notice a little burst of red magic as the structure crumbled, so maybe that was Wanda casting a spell to save herself at the last second, or maybe that's what happens when a toad gets struck by lightning, or a, a witch gets crushed by a building. Jury's out on that one, but there is the old adage, no body, no death, or at least not a confirmed death. Then again, there's also the idea of comic book deaths, namely no death is permanent except for Uncle Ben. He's still dead as hell. Countless heroes and villains have been killed off and resurrected in the comics in one form or another, including Doctor Strange and Wanda. We've already seen the MCU kill off and then Control-Z the deaths of half the universe, so clearly, you know, they're down to play around. There was a major comics plotline in 2021 where Wanda gets murdered, and then the Trial of Magneto storyline soon followed, and it turns out Wanda's murderer was Wanda. We don't want to spoil the whole thing, but Wanda ends up returning as a younger version of herself with a different point of view and having no memory of a good chunk of her life, which is a, a nice way of in-universe retconning things. Now, the MCU hasn't had as much time as the comics have to kill people off and bring them back to life, but we've already seen half the universe's population get blipped from existence and then get brought back on the big screen, so I wouldn't rule out a return from Wanda. It's very likely the MCU will eventually want to introduce the concept of mutants, and Wanda's reality-altering powers could certainly help facilitate that. While we're on the topic of mutants... We should tell him the truth. Characters have come out of other universes into our own in the last Spider-Man picture, No Way Home. But this will be the first time that characters from our MCU 
journey out into other universes. If you managed to see Multiverse of Madness without having the Illuminati spoiled for you by a YouTube ad, well, congratulations, because that was not easy. This mysterious faction was featured heavily in the marketing, but even so, they still delivered some of the movie's biggest surprises. This group holds order on Earth 838, a utopian version of Earth where not only do you stop on green and go on red, but where they've done extensive multiversal research following the death of their Doctor Strange. They established the default baseline vanilla MCU Earth is Earth 616, which means that it's the same Earth as the core comics continuity. Of course, in the comics, they already designated the MCU as Earth 199999, but who's keeping track? This particular Illuminati consists of Earth 838 Sorcerer Supreme, who's a good guy version of Carl Mordo. There's Captain Marvel, who in this universe is not Carol Danvers, but her best friend Maria Rambo. Then, of course, there is our first proper live action Captain Carter, who made her animated debut in Marvel's What If, but is here in the flesh, played by Haley Atwell. Then there's Blackagar Boltagon, aka Black Bolt of the Inhumans, who's played by Anson Mount, reprising his role from that ABC show that we don't talk about. This time around, they actually put him in an impressively comics accurate Black Bolt costume, which is awesome to see. Then we got our Professor Charles Xavier, played by the one and only Sir Patrick Stewart. We never got Hugh Jackman's Wolverine in yellow spandex, but we finally got the prof in his iconic yellow hover chair in his green suit for the 90s X-Men cartoon, and I, for one, was very happy about that. And last, but certainly not least, if that wasn't enough, some Fantastic Four fan service for the faithful out there with the first ever MCU appearance of Reed Richards, played by the much demanded John Krasinski. This is pretty close to the original comics version of the Illuminati, which consisted of Doctor Strange, Professor Xavier, Mr. Fantastic, Black Bolt, Iron Man, and Namor the Submariner. And the lineup might be different, but the deal is kind of the same. It's a group of super people who are trying to keep the Earth from getting messed up, but they're doing so in a much more orderly, business-like fashion than your standard superhero teams. In this case, they're fully aware of the threat Doctor Strange in any form poses to the state of the multiverse, as their version used the Darkhold to defeat Thanos and was subsequently vaporized by Black Bolt, whispering an apology for vaporizing him, which is what vaporized him in the first place. Anyway, they're understandably not about to let Doctor Strange of any universe waltz into their universe and do whatever he feels like. Their position is that any Doctor Strange variant from any universe poses a significant threat to the entire multiverse, and they base that assumption off of the experience that they had with their Strange, who did an incredible amount of damage in his offensive to defeat Thanos. But before the Illuminati can deal with Strange, and before the audience can get too attached to any of these fan-favorite characters, Wanda shows up to brutally murder everybody. Mr. Fantastic gets unraveled like a polio string cheese, Black Bolt gets his mouth sealed shut like Neo in the Matrix, and then accidentally explodes his own brain by trying to talk, which is what I thought would happen if you tried to suppress a sneeze when I was eight. Captain Carter gets Darth Mauled in half by her own shield, and Maria Marvel gets crushed under a big old statue. Professor X's telepathic abilities make him a pretty good judge of character, and he tells Doctor Strange where to find the Vashanti, which is the opposite of the Darkhold. It's the nice book, the good book. We like that book. Wanda shows up, Xavier enters her mind, and then tries to wrestle the good version of her out from a pile of psychic rubble, but then the evil personality shows up in, presumably, her own brain, and then snaps Xavier's neck, which breaks his neck in real life, because... superheroes. Okay, so let's be real. It's a little cheap to cart out a handful of fan-favorite characters and then immediately kill them off. I guess that's one of the fun things a multiverse allows you to do, but come on! How long have you been waiting to see Professor X in the yellow chair? Or see Black Bolt with little tuning fork and little armpit wings? Or see Reed Richards not how they've shown him in any of the Fantastic Four movies, none of which were close to Fantastic. A lot of people are going to take Krasinski's appearance here as confirmation that he's the new Mr. Fantastic, or that Sir Patrick Stewart will be returning as the MCU's Professor X, but keep in mind they're sitting up there alongside Captain Carter, who was front and center in Marvel's What If Disney Plus series. You know, the hyper-hypothetical show about things that explicitly didn't happen that way. Now, allow me to swap my in-universe tinfoil conspiracy hat for my professional Hollywood speculation helmet for just a moment. The MCU Fantastic Four movie was announced in 2019, and no casting has been officially revealed just yet, and it just lost its director like last week, so that movie is at least a couple of years off. Marvel Studios has pumped the brakes on offering stars crazy multi-picture deals like they did in the MCU's infancy, but even so, they will likely want a Reed Richards that they can stretch across multiple films, pun intended. Krasinski is definitely not too old, he's about the same age Robert Downey Jr. was when he first played Iron Man, but considering how successful A Quiet Place Parts 1 and 2 were, it wouldn't be surprising if Krasinski wanted to spend more time behind the camera than at the gym getting in spandex wearing shape. The Loki series has established that variants can have different, sometimes totally absurd appearances, so even though Reed is played by Krasinski here, don't get your hopes up. The character could be very well recast for the Fantastic Four movie, but it's safe to assume that in any case, this version, the Earth 838 version, is donezo. 
Sir Patrick Stewart, meanwhile, is 81 years old, and he's spent quite a few of those years working on X-Men movies. I would not blame him one bit if he would rather play with his rescue pit bulls than be in X-Men movies when he's pushing 100. Disney has no X-Men movies currently announced, but you can bet that when they do, they're going to want to milk that sizable corner of the Marvel Universe for all it's worth. And Xavier literally puts the X in X-Men. Maybe James McAvoy is going to return, or maybe we'll get somebody new, but Xavier's appearance here feels much more like a fun victory lap for Sir Patrick and some nice fan service to remind us that X-Men fans, that Disney has not forgotten about us, and I, for one, was very happy about that flying yellow chair. All right, here's the fun part. We round up as many Easter eggs as we possibly could. Here's what we got. The 838 version of Dr. Palmer says she works for the Baxter Foundation, which is a clear nod to the Fantastic Four and the Baxter Building, of which the top floors serve as their base. Noah Baxter is a former professor of Reed Richards and helped him build out their quarters in the New York Building, which has also been home to the Parker Industries. In the comics, the Eye of Agamotto has very different uses than in the MCU, where it's pretty much just a time stone container. When in use, a third eye usually appears on the forehead of its user. With 616, Prime Strange's reveal at the end, perhaps this indicates a higher level of awakening for him. Some of the comic eye abilities include playing back recent events and revealing truths, and it also doesn't work for evil users, so maybe it's different in the MCU once again? I can do this all day. Captain Carter says, I could do this all day, which is a Steve Rogers callback we could listen to all day. Reed Richards mentions that he has children, meaning more than one child, meaning the children of Reed Richards and Sue Storm, likely Franklin and Valeria Richards, exist in Universe 838. Franklin is possibly the most powerful being in the entire Marvel Universe and is a known reality warper, much like our friend Wanda. Valeria is his younger sister, who was born a normal human, albeit with a meager genius-level intellect. Oof, tough break, Valeria. The monster that's strange in America and Wong fight is Gargantos. In the comics, Gargantos is actually an enemy of Namor the Submariner and looks a bit different. The big screen version of Gargantos is very clearly Shuma Gorath's design, though presumably this eldritch weirdness is due to Shuma Gorath's complicated likeness rite since he was first introduced in the Conan Barbarian books, which were later adapted into Marvel Comics. Shuma sort of shuffled his way over to Doctor Strange, and the point is that adults with law degrees have had long serious discussions about a giant one-eyed tentacle demon which is pretty funny when you think about it. When Professor X shows up, a few notes of the iconic X-Men animated series theme play. Disney, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. When you put those X-Men in the movies, use that fucking theme song. Danny Elfman not only composed the score, but also the precocious ditty performed by Tommy and Billy, which is officially listed in the credits as the ice cream song. A pizza ball isn't exactly an Easter egg, but it's round food, so close enough, and Pizza Papa was none other than the legendary Bruce Campbell, who then later showed up in the post credit scene. He, of course, got his start in Sam Raimi's Evil Dead films and regularly cameos in his other movies, and this isn't the first time that Raimi's had him fighting with his own hand. Another Raimi regular is the yellow 1973 Oldsmobile Delta 88, which you can spot floating in midair when Doctor Strange and Christine stumble into the collided universe. This was Raimi's real-life ride when he was first filming Evil Dead, and since using it in his first film, he's put it in everyone since. Everyone knows Mickey Mouse, but Oswald the Lucky Rabbit? Wanda's kids have an old cartoon on in the background featuring one of Walt Disney's lesser known creations. He previously got a mention in episode five of Loki on the marquee of a movie theater in the void. So it's kind of a cute in joke suggesting an alternate timeline where Mickey never happened. But what did you think of Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness and where will we see Doctor Strange pop up next? And also, is Wanda dead? Let us know what you think down in the comments below, and thank you for watching this episode of Cannon Fodder. For more Doctor Strange, check out his whole story leading up to the Multiverse of Madness, and don't forget to follow and subscribe to IGN wherever you like to watch.